Welcome to Dadbot History. I'm Eric, and we've been away for a minute, haven't we? Um, so this episode you're about to listen to was recorded on February 12th, and today, as I'm recording this, is April 15th. And we recorded this episode two months ago, and then things got away from us. We all got busy. <clears throat> One of my responsibilities uh, in education is coaching basketball, and that took a lot of my time. Uh, just around mid-February, things really took off and, and slipped away from me. Um, but we recorded this episode, and it's a very special one because we recorded with Nick, who was there at our very first episode of Dadbot History. Uh, and he joined us. Uh, our main topic was based on the blockbuster, amazing uh, landing of Kevin Durant by the Phoenix Suns. And so we spun that into history as best we could um, to talk about you know, that trade, other big NBA trades in history, and kind of the NBA playoff outlook as of February 12th. And things, of course, have changed over eight or nine weeks. Uh, we also took some time to uh, talk about Chinese spy balloons and the Turkey earthquake, uh, the derailment in East Palestine, Ohio. Uh, and then we kind of went back into look at some real histories, the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand that Jake wanted to talk about and, and go into some detail about. We also talked some modern geopolitics and then did our dad front stories at the end. Uh, there are some audio issues with this episode um, that took some time to work out, and uh, I, I hope they're they're done as well as I can. But if they're not, you'll just have to deal. Um, and we would love to be doing this more frequently, and, and I believe we should be able to do so coming up soon. Uh, if you want to help out with that, like, subscribe, share it with your friends and your enemies. And, um, you know, maybe we can make this take off and we could do this, you know, something like full time. Uh, but that's going to be on to our subscribers and viewers. Um, so without further ado, I have already co-opted and usurped Jake's intro. Uh, here's our episode from February 12th, Dadbot History. Dadbot History. Yeah, well, roll let's, in, uh, no, I'll roll this in. Yeah, Jake's got this. Yeah. Oh, did I say Nick? Yeah, I'm so excited to have him. That's all. all right. Well, welcome to this episode of Dad Bod History. I'm Jake. We got Eric and special guest Nick. You know, no, not special guest. One of the original hosts Ooh. who's mm. now made his triumphant return because we're talking basketball finally. So, uh, topics for tonight: sports. Two things I want to talk about in sports: LeBron passes Kareem as the all-time scorer, and the Suns get Kevin Durant. Yes. We'll also do uh, some old news. We're going to talk about St. Valentine's Day, the mysterious objects that the United States Air Force keeps blowing That's out of the sky. That's why I'm in the bunker right and, now, And uh, the track. That's why I'm in the bunker. It's because yeah, of the I UFOs. Figured, I think, no, it makes sense. <laughs> You're smart. Hawaii would be their first strike. I understand. Um, and then discussing the tragedy of the... Karam on Maras earthquake that occurred in Turkey and Syria on February 6th. And then finally, we'll wrap it up with a historical hypothetical on the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand. But, That's a lot of stuff. Ooh, I know. We'll see what happens. But starting us off, let's talk about some sports because we have some huge sports news um, happening in the past week or two. Oh, also... The Super, Super Bowl, Bowl just wrapped up a couple hours ago. <laughs> that did happen. I guess that's something. It's not as big as NBA trades. Really but... limped across the line those last five minutes. One of the best Super Bowls I've seen, one of the most competitive Super Bowls I've seen, but because of that questionable holding call at the end, um, essentially giving the Chiefs the victory, uh, kind of ended on a dud, which is a shame because it was a really, really good game all across, all across the board. But, yeah, Chiefs win the Super Bowl. Mahomes gets his second uh, Super Bowl ring. Andy Reid gets his second as a coach. And, uh, sadly, Jalen Hurts, who, man, I really like watching him, uh, didn't get the win, and the Eagles didn't get the win this year. But uh, I don't want to talk too much about that. If you watched it, you already know what happened, so we don't need to recap that. But let's, uh, let's talk about two things in basketball news. So on February 7th, LeBron James surpassed Kareem Abdul-Jabbar as the all-time scoring leader, breaking his record of 38,387 points. Now, the question is, who is the greatest player of all time, and why is it LeBron James? Oh, Eric? no. Gross. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... 
Uh, you go first, Eric. No, See, I tell just, me what your opinion is. I just listen. I, so I had this conversation the other day uh, with somebody. Um, sure. All the stats. It's still, uh, I think Jordan's like the things Jordan has been it. awarded, like the number of of finals. Like he's he's six and zero in the finals. LeBron is like three and six in the finals. Um, it just Jordan still just. Okay, Jordan didn't score as many points, but Jordan won a heck of a lot more. Yeah, but um, in terms of things that he won, recognized. I yeah, no, no, shut up. Just like no, I'm I sorry, agree with you. Nick. So here's the conversation. Here's the thing. The conversation I had with somebody is that um, here's the the problem I have with LeBron. Um, I think as far as character goes, I think he he's got like the cleanest public image like personally in his personal life sure. like at, as far as like family life kids like he's pretty on the straight and narrow compared to other superstars that's fair the problem i have is that like his oh, like his, oh gosh the echo's killing me oh is it is it me is it the Baby. Feedback yeah, baby. I don't have headphones. Um, sorry. Oh. Um, hold on. Talk. See if that's better. You can cut this part cut out. This. All right. I can't hear it now. All right. But well, you can still hear me, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Continue. So, so it's it's like his, not his personal image, which I find to be as impeccable as any. It's his professional image that just bothers me. It's the it's the off the court stuff that still fits within the professional realm that bugs me. The the press conferences for every time he's gonna go somewhere else and and you know, become a free agent. It's constantly being on page one of, of all the books in the world he's ever read. He's only read the first three pages. Uh, and it's a, it's all the photo ops. It's all of the things that he tries to portray. And they, they just don't work for me. And then I'm, I'm not a big fan of the, you know, the unwillingness. I, I know he wants to speak truth to power unless that power is China. Because they've got their hand in the NBA's in the NBA's pocket, so it's sure. But Jordan also said Republicans buy sneakers good too. Point. Like, yeah, I know. I again, but there was never. I don't know. Like Jordan's personal character, fairly suspect, right? Like, okay, well, but no, but, I, but LeBron yeah, just absolutely. always kind of irked me. I think the thing with with Jordan and LeBron, like if you look at the numbers. Um, you know, Jordan averaged more points per game. Yeah, uh, but LeBron averaged more rebounds, more assists. Um, in sheer numbers, LeBron is over his career has thirty eight thousand points, ten thousand rebounds, ten thousand assists. Jordan does not even come close to those raw stats. Um, but I, I think the issue isn't so much the stats. I think part of it is that. It seems like LeBron has always been chasing Jordan's ghost for for a big part of his career. And I think that's where it's like you know, he did Space Jam two for heaven's sakes. Like Yeah. How much more on the nose can you be? I'm gonna chase Jordan and then to do a Space Jam movie. And it was not that good. Um and so I think that's where it's like, who's better? I mean, probably LeBron. Like, his numbers are better, he's played longer, and he's played at a higher level longer than Jordan did. Like, I know the Lakers aren't good right now, but LeBron is still putting up pretty solid numbers um, this season, even though the Lakers themselves are not doing well at all. I don't know if Jordan's last couple seasons with the Wizards or whatever it was, you could say the same thing. This is where it gets really hard to compare eras, because if you watch The Last Dance... Um, you know, you've got this situation where 
Jordan is in the locker room smoking cigars and he's talking about drinking beers after games his first mm-hmm. few years in the league. And, um, you know, it, it's obviously, it's obvious that they're, they have different ways of looking at the way that they take care of their bodies. Right. And some of that is what we know now about health and, and nutrition and sure. that sort of thing. And some of it is just technology where they have better recovery methods and, and uh, better technology for recovery. But I mean, I, you could argue about, you know, whether or not it's those things and the way those things have changed or whether it's a mentality thing and that LeBron shouldn't be sure. penalized because his mentality for taking care of himself was actually better and more advanced than Jordan's was. Cause Jordan definitely took care of himself, but he wasn't as serious about it as any at any point as I think LeBron was from the time he came into the league. Because LeBron, I think, looked at it as a business yeah. from the time he, you know, was drafted. He was he had a plan for what he was going to do and how well he was going to take care of his body. And and I don't know if Jordan had any of that. I think he was just really really competitive. And uh, and then he learned the business side of. Well, it. where was it in the Last Dance where? Well, and in the last dance, isn't it where Jordan gets hurt, like severely hurt, and he basically forces himself to get healthy, and like they try to put him on a minutes restriction, and he basically ignores that, and like you said, he just abused yeah. his body to pursue that greatness. Yeah, no, I, I think that's definitely part and, of it. And then you know, watching those clips, his father gets murdered, right? And, mm-hmm. and oh, he dude. retires for two years. And when you rewatch that documentary, you, know, you don't realize at the time, because I think we were all pretty young. Um, but you, you think about it and you're like, I think he retired because his dad got murdered. I don't think he was bored with the NBA or that he was lost, had lost his competitive edge. I, I think he just couldn't tolerate everything that came with being Michael Jordan while he was grieving his dad. And that's crazy because mm-hmm. he lost two seasons to that, right? And and then you you, you add that yeah. to um, to not playing as long anyway, right? As as LeBron has has played, and of course his yeah. stats are going to be lower. Of course he's yeah. not going to have as many points or any of those other things. So he he takes two seasons, he, he off. Takes two seasons off, comes back, and three three more, right? yeah. Like, uh, that's that's something else entirely. He's got six championships to LeBron's four. LeBron yeah, has I, lost I, more finals than he's won. Fine. But he's been to ten, which is ten. impressive. And he went to nine in a row. Like, And he led subpar teams to nine finals in a row. Like, some of those Cleveland teams had no business being in the finals. Yeah. No, he, there's no doubt he's a great player. Well, he's coming out of the East those years. The East was bad. For sure. No, I get it, but... It's still not easy. <laughs> it's still not I, easy. I think. No, not easy. there's nothing easy about it. Yeah, so I, I, I would still take Jordan, but I cannot confirm that that is not because, uh, you know, I was a kid. I was in high school when he was when he was great, middle school and high school. So, is there yeah. some uh, uh, nostalgic bias? I'm sure there is, but I also oh, think sure. he still has a pretty good argument as an all time great. All right, so let's move on to the next topic for sports. Uh, before the trade deadline this past week, the Suns acquired Kevin Durant from the Nets. And all they had to do was pay the small price of Mikhail Bridges, Cam Johnson, Jay Crowder, and four future first-round picks. Now, Dre Crowder was then traded from the Nets uh, to the pay, uh, to the Bucks via trade of the Pacers. Um, is this, like, the biggest trade in NBA history? That's my first question. Is it the biggest? It's got to be up there, because I was looking... And there's some other blockbuster trades. Uh, there's an article from the Sporting News. Um, Wilt Chamberlain in '65 was traded to the war from the Warriors to the Philly um, to Philadelphia, and then in '68 Wilt Chamberlain was traded from Philly to LA. 
Oscar Robertson is traded in 1970 from the Royals, Cincinnati Royals, which was a team, uh, to the Bucks. And then in 75, Kareem was traded from the from Milwaukee to L.A. And then in 76, the Nets to Philly, um, Dr. Julius Irving. And then in 2004, Shaq was traded to uh, Miami from L.A. But I don't know if any of these happened during mm. – the season. I think they're all off-season trades. Yeah. I mean, some of those guys you mentioned. Yeah. And, and and some of these. Well, some of the trades were huge trades, like, you know, Wilt Chamberlain. But, like, the people that he got traded for, I don't even know who they are. And I'm not a basketball fan, so that's part of it. But, like, Wilt Chamberlain was traded from the Warriors to the um, 76ers for Paul Newman, Connie Deerkling, and Lee Schaefer, and some cash. You don't know who like, Paul Newman is? Well, the actor, yes, but not the <laughs> the NBA All-Star. Same guy. Like, And they shedded Wilt Chamberlain. Th- this is why the Warriors wanted to get rid of Wilt Chamberlain to shed his burdensome $75,000 annual salary. It's oh, too goodness. much <laughs> to, to pay for Wilt Chamberlain. It's same thing, like uh, Oscar Robertson went from Milwaukee or from Cincinnati to Milwaukee for Charlie Polk and Flynn Robinson. Like I don't who are these guys? Yeah, like, but I mean it could be it could be in, just, in twenty five years that nobody knows who Mikhail Bridges is. Maybe they were good. Maybe they were yeah. good. I just don't Yeah, maybe they were the Mikhail Bridges of that time. Now Shaq, his trade from the Lakers to the Heat, um, the Lakers got Karan Butler, Brant, Brian Grant, Lamar Odom, and two draft picks. So I think that was a pretty hefty haul for Shaq, um, who was at the top of his game at this point. Yeah. The difference now but, is that a lot of these teams are trading unprotected first-round picks for these stars. It happened with uh, Gobert when he went to Minnesota this past offseason. They gave up. I think it was uh-huh. like six unprotected picks somewhere in that range. And then the Suns just gave up four unprotected mm-hmm. first round picks. So there's a lot of devaluing of first yeah. round picks right now. And I'm not sure what that's about. But I mean, you know, when I first heard about the trade as a Suns fan, this Durant trade, my, honestly, my first reaction was kind of I was bummed that they traded so much, right? Because it felt like we mortgaged our whole future for this guy who's 34. He's one of the best players in the league, but he's 34. He's also currently injured. Like, he's not going to play for the Suns for another couple yeah. of weeks. So that's kind of rough. But it's also... once I, The more I thought about it, it's like, all right, well, if you're scared about mortgaging your future, then that means that these couple of guys you traded, and maybe one of the picks you traded, are going to equal... Kevin Durant at some point in terms of the effect that they have on your team. Like you're hoping that sometime in the next two or three years or four years that all these guys are going to add up to what Kevin Durant brings to your team if you're not going to trade for Kevin Durant. And the more I thought about it that way, it's like, no, this is the same if not a better window. Even if we only have two years with Durant and this core, this is a better chance at a title than thinking – if we wait a few more years, maybe these guys will all bring us bring us a championship. So I don't have a problem with it. I'm all in on it now. Hey, hey, Jake, are you hearing him? Yeah, it's choppy. Oh, it's crap. really choppy, Nick. Okay, let me. So you might I have to say all that. Let me. Uh, is, is that better? <laughs> Any better? Nah. Here, can do some editing for this one. Uh, I know. Uh, what's wrong with your internet, Nick? I know we lost him. Oh. Is that any better? He kicked me hey, off hey. completely. Yeah. All right. All right. So go back yes. and say what you Sorry, said, guys. whatever that was. Uh, is it good now, though? <laughs> is it choppy? It's okay. 
it's, it seems okay. to be fine right now. Yeah, it's much um, better. So, I think the, the way I looked at it was when I first heard about the Durant trade, um, I was actually, as a Suns fan, I was kind of upset because I felt like we had mortgaged our entire future, right? We got Bridges, Johnson's, our, our two young wings, four unprotected picks, a pick swap. Jay Crowder, I was happy to get rid of him. And you got him on, on your bucks, Jake. So good luck with that. It's an interesting yeah. experience. Thanks, man. Um, so so I was upset because I was like, oh, we mortgaged our whole future for this guy who's 34 years old, also currently injured, by the way. He's not going to play until after the All-Star break. Yeah, oh, he's, he's got a sprained MCL right now. So that's not great. Um, but he's also one of the best players. Still one of the best, like, three to five players in the league. So I was kind of upset about it um, at first. But the more I thought about it, I thought, okay, well, if you don't like the trade, then what you're essentially saying is you think that Mikhail Bridges, Cam Johnson, and maybe one of these picks are going to equal what Kevin Durant brings to your team at some point in their career, Right. Like sometime in the next couple of years, mm-hmm. they're going to yeah. bring as much or more as Durant. And once I thought about it that way, I was like, no, I don't think so. I'm willing to bet on two years of Durant in his prime to bring me a title over a maybe of what the primes of these other guys could equal. So I'm all in on it now. Yeah. No, I, I, you know, I was looking at these other trades that happened with like uh, Will Chamberlain and Oscar Robertson, Kareem. And Shaq, and within a year or two, I guess Oscar Robertson was no, it was a year or two. They all won a championship yeah. with their new team. Like they, that was that was the piece that put all these yeah. teams over the top. Um, because the Bucks had never won one with Oscar Robertson, they won one. Obviously, Kareem was there. Um, and but then when Kareem went to the Lakers, they won their first championship in like eighteen years. Like. That was the piece that they had. And and so maybe the Suns are looking at it that way and they're like, we need this piece to get us over the top. We can't get out of the West without a Kevin Durant. And we probably can't beat whoever the East is sending right. without a Kevin Durant. I mean, that's – Yeah, you think that, that they just did the math. Not just like NBA history, but the Suns history, right? 1993, they brought Charles Barkley in. Yeah. And for like two or three years – they were dominant. They they didn't win the finals, but it turned that team like it gave them that big bump. Two thousand four, the Suns bring Steve Nash back. It rockets us to the next level for three or four years. Mm-hmm. Two thousand twenty, the Suns traded for Chris Paul. You know, after the eight no bubble run, they get Chris Paul, and it just it changes not just like the fact that you have a better player but also the fact that it gives the players on the team. You look at, uh, like, the list of players on the Suns in 2019. It was like, who? Like, I recognize this Booker name. I don't know any of the other names on this, right. this roster. It's bad. Yeah. Like, T.J. Warren was on that one, right? But um, but it was. it's a list of the Dragon Bender was on it. But, you know, so – you bring in Chris Paul and suddenly all the pieces that were starting to fit come in together. So now you have this team that is poised to do well. They've suffered this season because they've had so many injuries. And now you add this piece. That's one of the top five yeah. pieces in the NBA to Devin Booker, Chris Paul. It's well, if, I mean, if that's not enough to get you into a championship like run, I, yeah, I'm not I mean, sure they... what is. They don't have a great bench now, but we just signed this guy, Terrence Ross, who actually used to freak me out when the Suns would play him because he would go on scoring runs. Um, so I'm kind of stoked about having him. But um, I mean, the, the bench is still the same. But our bench was thin already, and then we just got rid mm-hmm. of three pieces. You know, like you can call Mikhail Bridges and what, one what, what one of those pieces wasn't playing. Which was, One of those pieces have been injured for 25 games. I'm just saying, I'm not saying that it affects whether right. or not the trade was a good decision, but it doesn't help our bench, right? <laughs> it does make our bench even thinner than, than right. it already it was. So, 
But I think Terrence Ross is a big signing, and I'm hoping we'll get maybe one other buyout guy. Um, but I, th- I think the most so the most interesting and sort of exciting thing about this whole trade is not the trade itself; it's actually Matt Ishbia, because the Suns owner takes yes. over the team. Yes. On like a Tuesday, <clears throat> and on a Wednesday, he's trading for Kevin Durant. No, 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 no. On, on Wednesday, he officially took possession of the team. On Tuesday, it was voted. Wednesday, he took possession of the team like 1 p.m. on Wednesday. Ten hours later, he's yeah. like, make this and, happen. And like, it adds money to their wild. Account. Like a lot of money over the next few years, I'm pretty sure. So, it, you know, he's willing to make big moves. He wants to win. He's willing to spend money. These are all really good things. Yeah. And... So, so where where I know some people are worried, oh, you're mortgaging the future by giving rid of all these picks. Well, if you're giving rid of the, all the picks, how do you bring people yeah. in? Free agency. If you're making these kind of moves, it also communicates to the rest of the players in the league, we're going to take care of you. It's not exactly. Sarvers anymore. Yeah. It's, it's something else. And, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, there was rumors of Isaiah Thomas. We squashed that. Yeah. Thank the Lord. And <laughs> I saw that name. So, I just do not like that guy. But, um, you know, it was just like he, he's, he wants to win, and that's enough to bring players in. Proven free agents, not draft picks that are yeah. sometimes a coin flip. No, it's a big deal. I'm excited about it. So, yeah. so then my next question is, Right now, the Suns are sitting at fifth in the West. Ahead of them are the Mavericks, Kings, Grizzlies, and at the top is the Nuggets. Uh, Does adding Durant, you know, assuming he's healthy and stays healthy the rest of the season, and the rest of your team does, does this get them out of the West? Does this make them able to beat any of those four teams ahead of them in a best of seven? I'm fine in the West. Mr. Zomarant over here is what he's referencing. Like he he said that, and everybody's like, "Really? You think so?" Well, sir? he said it, and then they lost like seven in a row. Yep. <laughs> and then and then every team around them traded up. I you know yep. it's a great question. I mean, because yeah. we got Jokic in the Nuggets, yeah. and he's just a monster right now. I mean, he's right leading. He's probably our MVP. Yeah. As of as it Which stands, would be three in a row. I remember he was the MVP in 2021, and then the Suns <laughs> swept them. I like where you go with this. Um, I think I, I do too. I think it's you know the Nuggets are I think the biggest threat right now. I, I wouldn't count out the Warriors, but they're with this recent Curry injury. I think it's going to be hard for them to get uh, good positioning to be able to get through all three rounds of the playoffs. Yeah, I mean, right now they're ninth. Separation, Jake, between some of those teams. I mean, what's it take to get from ninth to like fourth? You know, what's the separation? Oh, it's it's a couple uh, games. So I mean, three games. It doesn't take. It's a crazy spread to get there. It's just can they put it all together? They kind of did something similar last year, the Warriors, you know, and then made it all the way to the finals. So I wouldn't count them Mm -hmm. out. I mean, I'm not going to trust the Kings in a playoff series. I think we could take them every time. They have no playoffs. Zero. <laughs> like those, it, we'd, we'd take them out. The uh, Mavericks obviously scare me because of what happened last year, and Luka just seems to have a little bit of a mental hold on us. Um, and then with this Kyrie thing, yeah. my hope would be that Kyrie will get distracted by some ridiculous thing and ruin everything. It's Texas. Where did he go? There's plenty to distract. Is that where he went? He went to the Mavericks? Yeah, he went to the Mavericks. So you got Kyrie and Luka, which is amazing talent. Um, but, uh, yeah, I just, I don't trust him to kind of hold it together and be focused for more than four weeks. So we'll see what happens there. So the Nuggets, I think are the biggest, the biggest threat, but if you look at the lineups on the Nuggets, you know, you got Jokic and he's tough, but we got a big center who can at least guard him, at least give him some problems physically, Mm -hmm. eating that match for Jokic IQ wise, but physically he can, he can stick with him. Give him, give him some issues, make him work for it. And um, 
you know, then the biggest concern becomes Jamal Murray. Well, yeah, and, and Jokic is going to be, yeah, Jokic is going to be, uh, you know, tasked yeah. defensively with DeAndre Ayton, but he's not going to be the scorer in those games. It's exactly, gonna be the and so guys. Ayton can just focus all of his energy on defense and, and giving Jokic problems. Jamal Murray is their second best player, and he he's kind of terrifying, but he's also Canadian. So, I mean, what's he going to do in the end? <laughs> you know? <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, it's Ask an interesting the analysis. The like to shoot yeah, down shoot, for shoot, shoot down something. Okay, so then, all right, let's assume they get out of the West, which I think is reasonable. Uh, right now, uh, the East seems to be a two or three team race between the Celtics, Bucks, and Sixers. Um, what are their chances so against to any me, of those three teams? So ever since I played the Bucks in the finals. I, I did personally oh, you did? when I was guarding. You played Giannis. them? No. Ever... <laughs> yeah. Well, it was right after he won the Super Bowl <laughs> with the Packers. <laughs> when we played the Bucks in the finals, they terrified me. Specifically, Giannis and Drew Holiday. Like, if those guys are on and they have the right supporting cast, that team is terrifying. And I don't think anybody can stop them if they're healthy, especially if they have Middleton making like 17 foot jumpers. Well, and they're starting to get yeah. healthy again. Middleton's been back for 10 games. They haven't lost since. Lopez is doing what he needs to do. They're kind of getting back to that 21 it would finals be my pick. form. And it shows because they just rattled It'd off be my 10 pick in, in a row. East. So we could have another Suns-Bucks finals. Yes. Anybody Let's that trusts James time. Harden to get to the finals as the second best player on the team is not in a good place mentally. So I, I'm not picking the Sixers. I think it's the, the Bucks and hopefully the Suns. Okay. What about the Celtics? You don't think? I think they're they've got it. Then I give them credit for, it. but um, they. I think it would be pretty improbable for a, a relatively young team to have a first year coach and go to the finals then lose that coach to a scandal, get a new head coach, and then go to the finals again. I just That feels improbable mm-hmm. to me, but I could be wrong. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I don't see anybody in the West stopping the Suns now. That doesn't mean it can't well, happen. I going to be health, but, Jake. I mean, Kevin Durant, I watched him when he was – when he was – when the Nets played the Bucks that year, they won the finals. Right. When the Bucks won the finals, and Kyrie was went out in game two or three because he rolled his ankle, and James Harden was just terrible. Kevin Durant still almost won that series for the Nets right. on one bad leg, like you know. And if his foot was a an inch shorter, that would have yeah. been a three instead of a two. And it's like, <laughs> like he was that. He was just. Almost by himself, yeah. they won that series. That's how good he is. And, like, if he's anything like that, coming back from this this uh, injury, it's going to be just scary tough. Because Booker, like, man, Booker's yeah. a machine. And I know Chris Paul catches a lot of crap, but, like, yeah. he's what they needed. I mean, when they got him, he made them a much better team. No, it's, it's going to be interesting. It's just going to be all about health for the Suns in the playoffs. You know, Durant getting a little older, yeah. having injury struggles the last couple of years, and, and Booker having all these weird, like, hamstring and groin pulls all the time. I don't like that. That's like shades of Kevin Johnson in the mid-90s, you know, just always being out with hamstring injuries. So, yeah. And then Chris Paul is, like, 38 now, so who knows what can happen. But I'm hopeful. Sure. Woo! <sighs> Do you think? Yeah, me too. Do you think part of it is last year the Suns just drove at at getting the one seed, getting more wins than any other Suns team in history? Do you think it's like we don't need that? We just need to get in the playoffs and we'll be fine. Do you think part of it's like, hey, I'm feeling a little tweak. Take a night off. Like, there's no reason to push yeah. it because we'll be fine yeah, in I mean, April. I think- over the years of watching the NBA, you can see coaches as well as teams go th- 
as they're put through their paces, they learn as well. And I think one of the things that I see in a lot of younger coaches that are pushing teams through the playoffs by themselves for the first time is they just really rely on their best seven, eight players. And they really play their best guys a lot of minutes. Mm -hmm. And they don't believe in, um, what do you call the way that they're resting players these days? Load, exactly. Load management. Load management. Um, At least when you watch, it doesn't feel like they do, right? And then (laughs) things like what happened last year happened to these teams that these coaches are, are running. And then you can sort of see their their mental strategy shift a little bit, at least in my opinion, right? And they start thinking more like what Eric's saying, which is like, okay, maybe we should give guys a night off. If somebody has a you know a foot that that's hurting, sure. let's just hold them out for a couple of weeks because it doesn't really matter if we win sixty four games again if we get beat in the second round of the playoffs. So I definitely think that that plays into it, and I would give credit to Monty Williams for making those adjustments this season if that's what's happening yeah yeah they got to be they got to be a little more like like coach pop yeah, look at look at pop and, and dude, <laughs> he's a master of it Kirk, over the years has has implemented that i mean i probably didn't help it didn't hurt him they had phil jackson and, and pop to learn from but he doesn't he doesn't really seem yeah. to care at all since they won those 67 games that season or how, how much did they win 72 those warriors teams Oh, yeah, that the was beast. the Bulls. Uh, 73 and 9. 73 and 9. Yeah, it feels like he doesn't yeah. care at all now. He just wants his team healthy for the playoffs, Steve Kerr. So. Yep. All right. All right, well, let's move on to uh, out of our sports segment for the night and then do uh, some old news. So on Tuesday is Valentine's Day. And so I'm going to give you a brief history on St. Valentine's. And then we're going to move on because I don't know about you guys. Is that a big holiday in any of your homes? It's non-existent. I just have to make sure I don't screw it up. <laughs> okay. You got to do something. I mean, my kids have to. My my kids have to do all their Valentine's for school, so that's why yeah. it's a big deal. Yeah, that's true. We we make sure the kids have a good Valentine's, and they you know do what they need to for their class. Yeah. yeah. For me, it's more but the romance. Between my wife and I... Yeah, I got to do something. Easy. Yeah, gotta this do, is a I family show. Something. I get in trouble if I don't do anything. Okay. I'm going to take her out for a nice thing or All right. know, well, art or something. But where did this whole thing come nice. from, Jake? Tell All us right. what happened before it was commercialized. Well, good old St. Valentine. Off. So, good old St. Valentine. He was born in 226 CE uh, in Turney, Italy. He died on, in 269 in Rome, around the age of 42 or 43. He died on February 14th. Um, kind of his, his story, he's a saint, um, says one of his stories, was that he healed a judge's daughter. Her name was Astoria. She was blind. He prayed over her, and her blindness was gone. And, and so as a result, the judge, who had imprisoned a bunch of Christians – let all the Christians go and convert it to Christianity, which is weird, right? Cause like, what if some of the Christians like deserve to be there? Like maybe they didn't deserve to be because they were Christians, but like they were thieves or robbers. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just saying a blank, blank and clemency seems a bit. I'm locked bit much, up because but... I'm a Christian. You're locked up because you stole bread, Jeff. <laughs> yeah. You know what you did. <laughs> so anyway, and then later on in his life, he keeps evangelizing, and he eventually gets arrested um, by the Romans because this was a time of persecution. And the emperor Claudius uh, Gothicus, or Claudius II, meets with him, and apparently he's very impressed with St. Valentine, but St. Valentine keeps trying to convert him. And Claudius is like, look, I'm not accepting Christianity. And St. Valentine's, well, I'm not recanting. And says, all right, well, if you don't deny Christ, you're going to be put to death. And St. Valentine said, well, I'm not denying Christ. And so then they beat him to death with clubs and beheaded him just to make sure uh, on February you 14th. Never know. You never know. It was a weird time back then. Uh, but supposedly, or a legendary story is that before he was executed, he wrote a letter to that same judge's daughter 
um, and he signed it from your Valentine. And some think that that's the legend of writing cards from mm. Will You Be My Valentine or From Your Valentines hmm. came from. Um, but then eventually he was venerated um, by the Catholic Church, and uh, he's celebrated in the Orthodox Church on July 6th. I don't know why, but that's just, that's the just, story of St. Valentine's. So it's not a totally Hallmark holiday. Like, I think it's gotten oh, more no. out of proportion. I love bringing up the, the beating to death with clubs and beheading. That's my favorite well, part I of think, Valentine's you know, Day. You know, be true to your hires. one. Yeah, don't deny your one true love. <laughs> yeah. You're willing to get beaten to death for it. Good luck. See anything wrong with that? All right. <laughs> Thus ends Favorite the Valentine's lesson. Day was 1929, though. Yes. What happened there, Eric? You know, you know. Isn't this a history show? Uh, Should be you're not going to tell them? Bunch of. No, yeah. no. You got to figure it out yourselves. Uh, yeah, a bunch Should of. Dad bought history. We don't tell were, you anything. We're executed. In like not mm. an alleyway oh, but like a warehouse, I did hear where about they that. were uh, handling a bunch of booze, and uh, was it two or three gentlemen came in dressed as police with Tommy yeah. guns and just all remember them yeah. all down. Guns. Yeah, yeah. So this yeah. was uh, Al Capone basically consolidating his power um, over Chicago, corporate and takeover. The same, is what it same was. Valentine's Day massacre. Yeah, seven people. Yeah, it was a merger. Some merger of sorts. Hostile merger. Seven mm -hmm. people were fired. All right. <laughs> seven people were We're let letting go. you yeah. go. <laughs> Corporate layoffs. Back when it was a lot more aggressive. <laughs> so there, you have two great Valentine's Day stories to celebrate on Tuesday. <laughs> if anybody... Has a date oh, sure that night. The, the, the real, the real history of Saint Valentine. Um, yeah, have her open the card with like the nothing, picture. With the nothing black moves a woman like Al Capone it. stories. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, or, or a picture right, of Saint story. Valentine. The the head just rolls off. Wait, have we? Go ahead, Love go it. ahead, Jason. I was going to ask you another question. I was yeah, just going to talk go about ahead, some. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, ask. I just. I'm a little blown away by this uh, unidentified flying object shoot down thing. Are we getting to that at some point? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll wait. That's oh, what next. Next. Okay. So I did That's the next. transition. That's what I was about to say. You, you did ahead. it perfectly. Yeah. So Chinese spy balloons or aliens. So on February 4th, the United States Air Force blew up a Chinese spy balloon off the coast of South Carolina, or so they want us to think. Uh, after it traversed the entire country, stealing all of our secrets, I'm sure. Um, and I heard, like, initially the president's like, we should probably shoot that down. And, like, the Joint Chiefs are like, no, 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 let's wait. Like, I don't know. I don't know what they were thinking, but I guess they were doing counterintelligence on it. But eventually he shot it down February 4th. Um, but since then, uh, on February 10th, 11th, and 12th, each day, a new unidentified object and that's how norad is classifying them as unidentified objects have been shot down one was shot over alaskan airspace on february 10th one was shot over canada uh, with canada's permission although did we really need it and then another one <laughs> was shot over uh lake lake huron uh, and that one was the bad that, that one was today. Your basketball players suck, and your Air Force sucks. <laughs> what are you going to do? Give me some maple syrup? Um, Wait, here, hold on. There was one spotted over China as well. Who said? Oh, I didn't know that. Like over China proper. Uh, this was on February uh, 11th, okay, I believe. So um, I saw. No, but here's the thing. Uh, did you all see the commercial yes, in the Super Bowl for you yes. 2 that was weird. Like, un unidentified object. I'm like, hold on. There's no way you you put this ad together, like, this I don't know. week. I mean, if you go back no. to... No, if you're spending no, I that much... I didn't put, to, put it together this week. What I'm saying is, I think it's a... They've been putting the balloons in. <laughs> yes, here. it's you It's Bono. <laughs> it's him. He's the one. I knew I it. just think it's a... The, it's him an and the edge. coincidence, because... I bet you, 
if you go back through all Super Bowls, there's a high likelihood of at least one commercial involving aliens or UFOs in every Super Bowl. Just because it's a really popular yeah, topic. They... So I just think it's a coincidence is what I'm saying. Okay. I don't think all that right. has it. But... Okay, Mr. Reasonable. But here's where... <laughs> all right. Hold on, hold on. UFO, U2. All right, you... Right? Letters. Like... <laughs> is this the conspiracy theory portion of the show? <laughs> okay. Yeah, this is where we get deep. Yeah, you two conspired. I do think to... that it's so, well, weird. I mean, the... I Go just ahead. think it's weirder than... No, nobody's talking about this, at least in the circles that I'm in for the last two or three days. I, I, it is like the front page on CNN and other, other sites, but... Yeah. It, it feels weirder than it's being discussed at, without any additional information. Like, there's nothing in the articles or the information that points toward, like, maybe this is Elon Musk, or maybe there's, we think it's probably China because of this. Mm -hmm. There's zero information that seems to kind of point away from aliens. And I'm not saying that it's aliens. I'm just saying why well, are the articles? And, and that's where it's like, so, so, so the general, <laughs> general Glenn Van Herc of NORAD is that they will not call them balloons because they're not, uh, because it is unclear how these objects stay aloft and move. <laughs> like that's a bit disconcerting. Right. Like, so <laughs> I, you know, I have a couple observations that I'd like I to address. Like One is, okay. These things are floating along, right? They're not zipping like those, those, remember those? Yeah, it's uh, not like the Phoenix tic -tac. lights. Well, it's not the Phoenix lights. It's not like those Tic Tacs of years ago that I went from like 50,000 feet down to five feet and then disappeared. Um, this is something that's floating. It's cylindrical. Why is our first instinct? I don't, I don't know who it is. Just to shoot it down. Like, why not observe it? Well, because try to get commercial close traffic. To it. It like, because if it's, well, sure, yes. but like, okay, clear Are traffic. You... Let's get a helicopter up there and get eyes on it. And just that's, no, that's the thing is, it. it's like they're like, see if there's a Ukrainian flag on it or something. I don't know. <laughs> no, but they're they're like, they keep sending F twenty twos to go blow it up, and they're like, well, it's hard to see what it looks like because F twenty twos move so fast. I'm like, well, then send something slower. Like, like yeah, we, send you don't a have Cessna. To send a, yeah, you don't have to send an F-22. Okay, I'm sure an Apache helicopter would That's do it. That's fair. But you, you, we have all the kind of aircraft that can observe Are you this worried thing. that we're pissing we off all aliens? The kind of... Is that what you're saying? Well, so, so that's my question. Like, if it's aliens, yeah. like, they show up and our first response is to, like, shoot them down. So what if they're killed, trying to like... send us Valentine's Day cards and we just keep exactly. blowing them up? Well, I mean, they have a few more days, but... You know, if like so, we've killed like twelve of their buddies, and they're like, "Well, these people seem kind of hostile," and we are like, "It's right up our alley." But it makes me think of that tribe that lives in that island in the the South Indian Ocean, mm -hmm. and anytime somebody shows right, up they just or like kill things fly over, they just kill them or throw things at them. Like, well, yeah, like we're just. A few we have a few thousand more years of technology than that tribe does, but we're the same. So you think the aliens are trying to evangelize us and we're throwing rocks at them? <laughs> yes. But, <laughs> it's the comparison. But what are these things? We're bringing the good news. What are these things? <laughs> pew, pew. That's what that's what I, the, no one is so, willing to offer an opinion or even a guess in any of the media or any of these articles or anyone that I'm talking to. It's just like, I don't know, we'll figure it out. What do we what is this stuff? Yeah. I don't know. When you it's, figure it out, will you tell us? No, like it, we'll it's it funny because I was watching on TikTok a video of a bunch of flat earthers trying to prove the earth is flat, right? And so they send a an amateur rocket like 300,000 feet into space. Like, like, did they just build that? And did they get clearance from the FAA? Like, I, I think some of this could be, I'm not saying it's flat earthers, but like, it could be just some group of people that are just sending stuff into the That's sky. What I'm wondering. You know, it's not necessarily alien, but it's just like this random group their, wants to put. I, I watched the model rocket today with my kid. So, <laughs> did an F twenty two come by and blow it up before it? It, landed? I mean, it wasn't. It wasn't airborne for very long. So, no. Oh, okay. I guess the, 
That's good. The thing, the quote that you read earlier, Jake, is the thing that is weird. It's like, we don't really understand how it's staying in the air. That's what that quote seems yeah. to say. Like, there was another quote I yeah. read that somebody was like, we think it might be an internal like balloon system or some sort of... And so, like, why are you saying stuff like this? This makes it seem like it's aliens. <laughs> like, when you say... I would rather they say... Yeah, I would rather they just say it's a weather balloon while they figure it out. Just to give me a peace of mind. Well, because they know weather balloon <laughs> is just a dog whistle for this is an alien. Yeah. And it's always That's can fine. Say. But that's like, been the company line for 70 years, yeah. and I've accepted it. I don't need you to be honest with me. Another, I need you to, another, like... Yes, give me an explanation that I will accept. Why are they being <laughs> so blindly. forthright with this information? Does anyone know when an F-22 yeah. shoots something down I over don't. Canada? Did, does anyone actually know that that happens when it happens? Like, why do they have to yeah, report I don't it? Think not unless Canadians. they tell us. There. Yeah, not unless they tell us. So, why? yeah, why now? Why are they... Why are these stories so out in front? You know, and and why are we? I don't know. Hey, interesting. I don't like I don't like this whole transparency and government thing. I prefer <laughs> a veil of secrecy. I'm just fascinated by the whole thing. All right. It doesn't seem like anybody else is quite as quite as much. Yeah, I hope I am. I'm, I'm pretty interested, but the information we're getting just doesn't give me enough to like. I guess you're right. Speculate. Yeah, further. there's not much more you could say, right? It, so here, I, I think, I think the government has over several hundred years of telling the truth and lying and telling half truth and telling half lies. Have figured out like the exact balance to keep people just not interested, and like you have to give them this much information, and that information is the perfect amount to give them, and they won't ask follow up questions. Yeah, maybe that's it. I don't know. It's just. It's odd. Yeah. I'd prefer the lie. That's me. That's where I'm at at this point. But <laughs> All right, let's move on to our next old news story. Uh, so the Ka, I'm going to say this incorrectly, and I apologize, Ka Ra Man Maras earthquake that took place on February 6th in Turkey and Syria. Uh, as of right now, over 30,000 dead confirmed, 7.8 magnitude earthquake. Uh, much of the area impacted um, is in northwest Syria and um, eastern Turkey. Uh, the northwest Syria area is held in opposition um, by opposition forces to the Bashar, Bashar al-Assad regime and the Idlib and Aleppo provinces. And uh, currently aid can't be delivered to those people because Assad is basically using this as leverage um, to get sanctions removed from him. This is one of the deadliest earthquakes um, in recent history, but um, not not the most deadliest. And we'll get into that in a minute. But uh, some other facts about this. Sweden, whose NATO membership depends on Turkey's vote, has pledged at least $3 million in financial aid, um, logistics, and materials to help with recovery efforts. And the Geisentep Castle um, has been destroyed. This was originally... Uh, an observation point for the Hittite Empire in, from 1650 to 1190 BC in the second century. It was uh, built into a castle by the Romans um, and it was expanded in the 10th century. And if you look at the before and after photos, it's just before there's a castle yeah. and after it's just rubble. Um, it was actually part of the Turkish War of Independence after the fall, after World War I, after the fall of the Ottoman Empire. Um, it was a t t Turkish defense point um, when the French tried to conquer this part of um, Syria and Turkey as part of their gobbling up of the Ottomans' colonies and, huh. and territories. So this castle is like, I mean, it's from it's a it's almost two thousand year old castle. The hill that was built on was used for thousands of years before that as a observation point for the Hittites, like, and it's just gone. Like, and you know, I, I don't want to overstate the human loss because the human loss is 30,000 people yeah. at, as of right now. But like this part of the world is also culturally extremely significant and historically significant as well. And there's just so much history and culture and, and then human loss as a result of this, this earthquake. Yeah. And it's just a tragedy on so many different fronts. 
So, um, yeah, I, I, I pulled up. I have a uh, an app called Quake Feed that shows, like, either maps or lists. So mm-hmm. it's kind of wild to look at because there's this – I mean, I'll try to show you. You can kind of see that stretch. It's just mm-hmm. not focusing in, but there's three – six plus magnitude earthquakes in that region over the that core those course of days six seven eight mm-hmm. and one of which was 7.5 which was 10 times was it 15 times stronger than the two 6.0 earthquakes and yeah. the, and these aftershocks that are happening all over are all five plus and, and those are the that's a kind of magnitude that can really ruin your day really mess things up right like yeah um but yeah it's a whole series of of earthquakes it isn't just one wow which is where it's you know you think you're in the clear after the one and then the second one comes along well in a lot of these places like aleppo um which luckily has only had several hundred deaths and this is in northwest syria it's been held by the rebels um during this this civil war that's been happening in syria since 2014 or whatever it is um but aleppo in 1100 ce 1138 ce had a small quake and then on october 12th of that same year a 7.0 magnitude earthquake happened destroyed most of the city and 230,000 people died as a result of that earthquake. Um, and Aleppo was like, it was like a capital city back then. And it's even in Syria today, it's in a hugely important city. Um, but in Turkey, uh, where this is happening or where this happened, it's like, I saw this photo of this father sitting at some rubble and he's holding his daughter's hand and his daughter has been buried under the rubble she's dead and he just won't leave her side because of he just won't leave until that they can get her out of there and you know bury her and take care of her but like it's just it's just so heartbreaking on so many levels and what's really frustrating especially on the serious side of things is that we can't get the aid that we need to get into that part of the country because Bashar al-Assad is holding it hostage um, so that he can get leverage um, to get his sanctions eased because of how terrible he is. Um, and so then my questions are, how does the world, and maybe more specifically America, respond to this crisis? Uh, so do we ease sanctions on Syria to help those people that need it? I don't know. I I, I would want to say yes, but I also don't want to give Assad some sort of advantage out of this crisis either. I don't know. What do you think? I mean, you know, I had this discussion the other day with a student. It was like the ethical framework of carpet bombing, of strategic bombing, right? Like, if you can make the situation better sooner by doing this thing that's going to cost lives. You know, it's just the ethical question, right? This thing of, you could say the same thing about sanctions. Are they really hurting Assad? Or are they just hurting people? Or are they just hurting Syria? Mm. Yeah. Do we do we maybe just need to lift our self-imposed ban on assassinations uh, for a few days? You know, just I don't know. Maybe. Or you know, maybe we supply aid by just invading the place of two hundred thousand Marines and say, "Piss off, Assad!" Like, sorry, we're here. If you want to come at us, we got two hundred thousand Marines. Have at it, but we're helping these people. I don't know. I don't like the idea of easing sanctions when it when it becomes this political stuff. It's it's yeah. But I mean, obviously, they... his concern for people is minimal. Is minimal. Although I know there's a lot of people that that support him too because he's been willing to stand up for other people. So it's, I'm sure there's more nuance to it than that. I don't know enough about him beyond the war, but. 
think it makes sense to use this. If that's really the, the only thing holding us back, then easing the sanctions um, with the understanding that he, if he breaks the, the rules again for, you know, whatever rules he was breaking to get the sanctions imposed initially, then we can just reimpose mm-hmm. the sanctions after we help people. That's true. That's a good, that's a good point. You know, yeah. and it's interesting, like Syria is as a result of this earthquake from what I've read suffered less than Turkey. Turkey took the brunt of the casualties and damage. Um, and we are somewhat unfriendlier. I mean, they're a NATO nation, so we're on friendlier terms with them than we are with Syria for sure. But I don't know. Just this is one of those no good answers sort of situations. Yeah. Man. But, I didn't even realize that was happening over there in that way. So. Yeah. Well, another thing, I, the the amount of coverage that I've that have gotten on the earthquake has been fairly minimal. Another story that is going on is in East Palestine, Ohio, where that train derailed. It's now just burning, and it's burning this highly toxic chemical, like. It's if you're in the area and you're breathing that stuff, it's it's going to. Yeah, kill you're going to be part of a class like, action lawsuit later. Yeah, that's what's going to yeah, happen. Yeah, well, your your wow. great your children and grandchildren will be part of the class action lawsuit because you won't still be here. Like it is yeah. bad, and it's just not being talked about. It's just it happens. And it's so you know it's so interesting because just a couple months ago we had these railroad negotiations and potential strike and. Congress and, and the Biden administration basically forced the railroad workers to not strike because they didn't want to shut down half the nation's economy. Um, but a lot of the things that they were complaining about are because of stuff like this, like the workers aren't allowed to take sick days and and it's a precision timing railroad. And so they, they're willing to sacrifice safety and inspections uh, for timeliness. And it's very, very likely that the railroad, the reason this derailment happened is because the due diligence that the, the people that work the railroads that were supposed to put into this inspection, they didn't do it. And as a result, this catastrophic failure happened. And now all these highly volatile acids and chemicals are burning into the atmosphere and poisoning the water. And yeah, it's, it's going to be awful to clean up. But you're right, it doesn't get our attention because we got balloons and unidentified UFOs. objects to, to to freak out about. Oh, maybe the UFOs are like, hey, we know how to like solve this uh, problem. Of the and then we shot it down. Train. Yeah, maybe that's keep it. shooting us down, so we'll keep sending them, but, you know. <laughs> All right. Oh, don't man. speak flaring and hanging. <laughs> I knew you had opinions. They're not Swedish. UFOs, I knew it. <laughs> So, all right. Well, that's the old news uh, for this week. Uh, And I got a final segment tonight. I want to go over a historical hypothetical because Eric and I did a video for TikTok that has done terribly uh, on the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand. But put so much work in it. What some doesn't, yeah, you put the most work possible in it and it does terribly. Where if I did zero effort on TikTok, it'd probably do really, really well. But No, I, I did zero right. effort tonight. I got zero views. Whatever. Okay. So, uh, on June 28th, 1914, Archduke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated. He was on a trip in Sarajevo to inspect the military there. Um, went along his route, an assassin uh, threw a grenade at his car. It missed the Archduke and his wife, but wounded some others. Um, Archduke Ferdinand and his wife then went to resume the route, but wanted to go check by the hospital to visit the wounded. Their driver, not realizing the route change, took a wrong turn, and then the car got stuck when it was supposed to back up in front of the Moritz Schiller's delicatessen when another assassin, Gavrilo Princep, happened to be standing there. He walked up to the car, shot the Archduke and his wife, killing them both. This event um, triggered the Austro-Hungarian Empire, of which the Archduke was the heir, to demand an ultimatum from the Serbians, which they rejected. Uh, This in turn triggered a large series of treaties and alliances known as the July Crisis, which eventually led to World War I. 
And as we all know, the result of World War I, um, four empires were destroyed. The Austro-Hungarian, the Ottomans, the Germans, and the Russian Empire were gone. Um, Japan became a preeminent power in the Pacific because they were able to gobble up some old German colonies. America became, I don't know if they were the superpower, but they became a superpower within the world stage after World War I. Um, 30 million casualties, uh, both that, civilian and, and military. Right? I've always been I mean, it's, to be 10 million casualties. I think this is counting. Oh, I'm, okay, 10 million civilian, KIA killed in action. Yeah, this is civilians and well, you know, wounded and, and all yeah. sorts of things. Okay. So, um, all that to say, had the assassination attempt failed, so they, they try to kill the Archduke, it fails, he and his wife survive, he remains the heir apparent, because the Archduke, he wanted a, a, a confederation style for the Austrian Hungarian Empire, where they were aligned, but they were not subject states. And so the Serbian, there would have been like a Serbian state that would have been part of this confederacy um, instead of Serbia being totally independent. So has the Archduke survived? How does the world look differently? Does World War I happen? Or does it happen later or differently? Um, do any of these empires survive? Uh, does America become a superpower because if they're not getting involved in the world stage, do they just stay home. Um, what are you thinking? Like, how would things be different had he survived? I'm not saying good or bad, because I think that's a nasty question, but just different. I mean, what, what it makes me wonder is go all the way to the end of World War II, because I don't think mm -hmm. World War II happens without World War One, right? In some ways. Because of the way Germany was left after World War One, and then that gave rise to sure. Hitler, is yeah. that a reasonable positive? So, yeah, it is. I, I think after, <clears throat> if you if you look at after World War Two, you know, one of the reasons that America became a superpower because I think that to me that's the thing that I hit on about your question is like, does America become the same level of superpower? Um. Mm -hmm. It, how much of our rise to that power was due to kind of um, economic, like, supercharging because of the war? Sure. And how much of it was just us being the only one left that didn't take major damage during World War II? Like we're, That's absolutely like, true. Or right? World War One. So are we still in the same or similar superpower -y position? without getting involved in the war at all. You know, like if we don't get sucked into the war. Well, I think, you know, one of the big results of World War II, which was a continuation of World War I, yeah. is that, like you said, Nick, at the end of World War II, there was no other global power that had a navy that could traverse the oceans. Right. The closest was maybe Britain, but pretty much everyone else's navy had been totally destroyed as a result yeah. of this. Um, and that allowed us to have the ability to dominate the seas and by extension, dominate the global economy. Right. And so if world war one doesn't happen or if it happens differently in some of these empires survive, if the German empire survives in any way, shape or form, you never have a Weimar Republic and you don't probably don't have a Hitler. Mm because he was able to come into power because the Weimar Republic was so weak. Right. So I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah. I mean, you, you might, so the conditions that existed for the Russian revolution in 1917, trying to think of a, of a, of a situation where the conditions for a similar revolution in Germany where either national socialists or communists take over, I, I don't see that without World War One. Or sorry, I don't see that without the 
the kind of blame for World War One being placed on Germany, right? So, is it possible the war happens in a different sequence of events, mm -hmm. but one where Germany doesn't end up with the blame? But you have to keep in mind, Germany's plan for the next war consisted of invading Belgium and invading France quickly. So whether they are the initial aggressors or not in the war, their, their plan of executing a war quickly and an invasion quickly uh, is going to put them as the perpetrator of the war, right? So whether it's this assassination or some other happening in the Balkans, or some border dispute with France, German Germany's Schlieffen plan is still going to be what they use. And that almost entirely is going to be used against them at the in the outcome of a war that they don't win, right? So, they, so you're saying they had that plan before the assassination. Yeah, that plan had been they always in had place for years. So um, so you're saying war is inevitable from that so point. Like before a lot the, of historians would say World War One is is not a result of the assassination. It's a result of nationalism, militarism, um, conflicting uh, alliances. You, you have conflicting alliances, imperialism. All these things are at play because it's not just that the European countries tend to go to war with each other; it's that they do so frequently. Like there's no there's no other territory in the in the history of the world that has been fought over as much as Europe. The European continent, except for places in the world where European countries have had colonies that conflict <laughs> with each other, right? And so that's what most of the world is contained. You know, in 1914, Africa is like 80 percent controlled by Europe. South America has still has European colonies. Asia has European colonies. So the reasons for these countries to go to war with each other are, are many. Like there's there's a ton of reasons to go to war with each other. Uh, they just need something to start it off. And this assassination worked out perfectly to start that, but it could have been any number of things. What matters is who's going to end up winning. Does that change by how the war starts? But also... Um, Who gets blamed? You know, because that's what leads Who's going to end up with too. the blame? Because if the war happens and Germany executes a different plan, say a defensive plan, and France invades... And Germany can finally sue for peace and say, hey, listen, um, we didn't really kick this thing off. Maybe we don't take as much blame. That doesn't he lead to the conditions. It. Yeah, I, yeah. It, it really comes down to a bunch of finger pointing. Um, well, here's the thing is that yeah. if the Austro-Hungarian heir, the Archduke, survives, do they issue that ultimatum to Serbia? And if they do, is it the same Mm. Or is it a little less stringent? Um, and if it is, because I believe the ultimatum that they submitted, the Serbians accepted everything except one point. And I think that one point was that basically the Austro-Hungarians could send in anybody police. they wanted to quell, like, resistance or yeah, nationalism. Yeah, Austrian police, and, they wanted to be able to go in and yeah. investi so, investigate whatever that means. So maybe the Archduke survives, and because he seems to be a moderating force within the royal family, maybe says, we have these demands, but we don't have these, and that takes that conflict off the table. So then, yeah, you still have Germany or France almost certainly going to butt heads in the next 20 to 30 years because they have several times before already. Um, so, they, you know, they, another... they decide to fight a land war in Europe instead of just a colonial war. and But then you take Serbia off the table. You take, in a sense, the Russians off the table because the Russians jumped in to support the Serbians. So you might, you might eliminate basically the Eastern Front. Right. Yeah, but any, any action involving France will involve Russia. Right, because they are, they are allied here. Yeah, but then you don't have to, you don't have the Germans spending time and resources helping the Austrians survive. Yeah. And you might keep the Italians out of it. 
And you might keep the Ottomans out of it. So Ooh, the English, it, the Brit, the Brits are getting involved. You know, it's interesting because the reason that Archduke Franz Ferdinand was the heir to the throne, you had to go back to Uncle Franz Joseph, right? He's the current emperor. You know, his younger brother was Maximilian I, who was put into Mexico as the emperor by Napoleon III. And, uh, like, a week and a half after Franz Joseph became emperor of Austria-Hungary, his brother Maximilian was tried and executed in Mexico because they had a revolution there. His son, uh, Rudolf, um, was the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne. But I, what was the year? 1889. He was 30 years old. He killed himself with his 17-year-old mistress. Like in a cabin somewhere. They found their bodies and then they tried to cover it up. They're like, yeah, he had an aneurysm of the heart. And like, they both did? And they're like, well, um, I mean, it was caused contagious. by a bullet. Like, yeah. <laughs> and, and so when Rudolf, when Maximilian's gone and Rudolf is dead... So everything goes um, over to Franz Ferdinand through his father, through Franz's father. Um, and, you know, Franz Joseph's, I guess, youngest son um, essentially was openly homosexual. And so the, the line Which was not going to go permissible. through him as long as yeah. Franz Ferdinand was around. But then he wasn't. And then, of course... Uh, there was only one emperor after Franz Joseph, that was Charles, um, who basically was there to abdicate because Franz abdicate Joseph died um, in the middle of the war. And, uh, yeah, like it's, it's a pretty, mm. it's a pretty tragic, the House of Habsburg, like 1800s are just a mess for them. The 1900s are no better. Um, and uh, Charles, uh, Charles the first and fourth, it is, uh, he basically reigns until 1918, a day after the armistice and then after like, yep, just monarchies abolished. So, you know, if Maximilian doesn't die, if, uh, Rudolf doesn't kill himself, Franz Ferdinand is not the heir and is not a target. And things go differently, right? Yeah. Huh. Yeah, definitely. All right. That's well, I think that wraps up our hypothetical for history today. And uh, before we wrap up the show, uh, do you guys have any stories from the dad front, any family stories or anything that happened over you the past week or so? I can go first. So uh, go my wife it. had this wonderful idea this week. It says, hey, why don't you take our daughter out for like a daddy daughter date and I'll take our son out, um, for, for a, you know, mother son date and, uh, do separate things. And so yesterday, that's what we did. I took our daughter out. She wanted to, I said, where do you want to go? And she goes, I want to go to this trampoline park. And so that's what we did. We went to this trampoline park for two hours and she was just nonstop energy. And I was nonstop energy for about half of that time. And then I tweaked my back and said, maybe I need to sit down. So, but, um, so we did that. And then, uh, I took her, you know, drove back and stopped at a, a diner and, uh, she was able to eat pancakes for dinner basically. Um, which is awesome. And so it was a really good day. And then my wife took our son to like, a, like a, it's not Dave and Buster's, but it's like Dave and Buster's bunch of games and, and, the uh, stuff like that and laser tag and, did that with him and it was a really good day. So I had never done a, a, just like a daddy daughter day before. I don't know if you guys have, but it was really special. Sounds off. Awesome. I'll do one of those pretty soon. We, you I, are? Talk, I feel like it's one of those things I talk about a lot. Yeah. It's one of those things I talk about a lot and then uh, just don't get around to. We did we the just getting busy with life. Daddy daughter yeah. dance last night. Oh. oh, nice. Um, which consists of us dancing for like five, ten minutes, and then sure. she hangs out with her friends, and I just chat with some dads. 
and it's fine. Like, Sounds magical. Like, let's go out to dinner. What do you want? Taco Bell? Awesome. Let's do it. Um, you know, dress up, go do the daddy-daughter ants, get pictures. Another it's great fun. Valentine's Day date night. Yeah. Taco Bell. Yeah. It was it was great. <laughs> this is the same way he got Amy. <laughs> that's, that's, hey, that's how he wooed you her. know, Nick, you were there. Uh, we went to prom, and I did we drive through a Wendy's? Did we? It was, I was driving my, my mom's minivan. Sweet. And there was, there was three of us couples. My future okay. wife yeah, and yeah, I, yeah. you and... Was it Nicole? Maybe. And then uh, Maybe. Maria and... I, I feel like we drove through like a jack-in-the-box. <laughs> you remember this night way better than I did. <laughs> Pay attention. Remember. Did we drive through a jack-in-the-box? Yeah, I... Very likely was. No, we. It probably was a job. You had some tacos, yeah. didn't you? Was tacos. Yeah, we were. We, we were pretty into tacos at that time. <laughs> that time, you weren't still. I remember yeah. when I first visited Arizona, and you guys were like, "Let's go to Jack in the Box and get some tacos." I'm like, "Okay." And you guys were like so amped up. I'm like, "I'm not sure that this is really meat." Like it's it not. was. It's vegan. <laughs> it's soy based, Jake. It's, oh my it lord! Still doesn't matter. It's amazing. But it's like. Two tacos for a nickel in a song, and I'm like, "Oh well, that's great. Let's do it." I survived off of those at one point. Yeah, I just put my hand in a change jar and said, "Oh, found, I found it." Found, yeah, <laughs> like two bucks, and you're full. So, well, I'm glad you had a taco bell. Oh, yeah, nice. with your daughter last night. Uh, something funny happened today, though. Uh, my wife and I took our our dog for a walk. And my, my oldest son came with us. And he is has become a reader. And he's been reading, like, the Nathan Hale books, which are the graphic novels. They're history books. Mm-hmm. And he's reading the one that I read with my seventh grade class called Treaties, Trenches, Mud, and Blood. And it's about World War I. Uh, it talks about the assassination. It talks about trench warfare. <clears throat> but he said, he said uh, Dad, you know, like, um, it was kind of sad what happened to the king of Russia. And I said, yeah, yeah, it was, like. And he's like, yeah, him and his whole family. I said, yeah, they all they all got shot. And he's like, yeah. He says, you know, what, what was the name? He was he was the king of Russia, but it was something else. I said, I said, czar. And my wife behind me, trolling me, says, czar. And I quick oh, turned around. Gosh. And she looked at me. She's like, I knew it would get you. I was like, I can't believe you did that to me. It's just cruel. <laughs> How dare she? Bizarre. That, that reminds me of the time in uh, school when we were in history <laughs> class. No, we were just in a study yeah, hall we inside of another history class, yeah. Eric and I. And the uh, the lowly juniors were in the class while we were seniors. So, of course, they're uh, assumed to have much less knowledge than we, you know, they're, they're As one much less think, mature yeah. than we are, right? It's like a whole nine months, probably, most of them. That, sure. The age difference. So Eric gets real judgy in this sort of situation. No. Noticed. Not Eric. <laughs> so they're, they're talking about the Civil War. And somehow it comes up what, what colors, you know, were the South and North known for wearing primarily. And somebody gets it wrong or doesn't know. And Eric has an absolute fit. Um, he just um, starts going off. <laughs> He can't control himself. People are offended. He's even more offended. And people are more offended at him. Who was the teacher? Was, that, bad was it Driscoll? It might have been Driscoll. Even the teacher was telling him to calm down. I, I, I That's when over. you knew. I was like, you're done. You're done. Eric, yeah. Like, Bugs Bunny talks about this. If you don't know it, you're trash. That's how you knew Eric had the heart of a teacher. You just could tell. He wanted to shape, exactly. shape young minds. He was judging everyone. <laughs> That's awesome, man. It's a good day. All right, boys. All right. Well, that wraps up this episode of Dadbot History. Thank you guys for joining us. Make sure you guys like, subscribe, follow wherever you get your podcasts. And uh, we'll see you all next time. Have a great day yeah. in history. Aloha. Aloha. Oh, nice. nice.